I'm going to talk for just a moment tonight about weight versus sin. I'm not going to keep you here long, so come with me as we go. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This speaks of weight, and it speaks of sin. Every weight and the sin that easily besets us a weight is something that we allow to be put upon us. A sin is something that we allow to be brought forth out of us. Weight and sin are different. They're listed as different because they are different. Literally, a weight is this. It is a heavy hindrance. A weight is a heavy hindrance. It's a burden that makes you bend. A burden is one thing, but a burden that makes you bend will cause you to be stricken. It's okay to be sorrowful, but to be stricken with sorrow is not okay. It's okay to bear a burden, but it's not okay to bear a burden that is so heavy that you bend. And the root word of this is a bulging manifestation of your being. You look abnormal. You know, a goiter, a tumor, a hernia, something's wrong with you, right? You look weird. When you're bending under a burden that is not yours, it's apparent. Parts of your body are bulging that shouldn't bulge. You're bent in a position that you can't function in because the burden is of the weight is too heavy. The Lord said, I will bear your burdens. He said, I will carry your load. When we don't give him our load, we can't carry our cross. When we don't give him the weight, we can't carry our cross. When we're so busy bearing a burden that is not ours, we bend and our very spirit becomes deformed. Some things are hard to let go of. I get it. I know. But tonight, you're going to have to let go of some things. A weight is a heavy hurt, hindrance, a burden that makes you bend. A weight becomes a hindrance to where you can't see God anymore. It's the ultimate distraction. It's a parrot squawking, flying around your head. As you're marching into battle, you're going to make a mistake. As you're marching up to worship, you're going to make a mistake. As you're prancing around living your life, you're going to make a mistake if you're tied to a heavy hindrance, to a bulging burden that makes you bend. You can't walk straight if you're bent with a burden. The Lord says, get rid of those things. Lay it aside. It might be your kids. They might be a bunch of rehabs. I don't know. Love them. Pray for them. Do your job, but don't let it handicap you. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your past. Maybe it's your addiction. Maybe it's your twisted little mind. Whatever it is, God says you better be very careful to not make that bigger than me. Lay it aside, he says. He doesn't say throw it down, and he doesn't say lose it. He says lay it aside. Very strategically, lift it off of yourself and lay it down and deliberately move on by. It isn't an accident. It didn't happen when you weren't looking. It's not a mistake when you lay it aside. You very deliberately take hold of it and say, I don't own this. I'm going to lay it aside lest I trip in my marching. I'm going to lay it aside lest I fall down and cannot get up. You have to lay the weight aside. 
It's heartbreaking sometimes. And it's a heavy weight. It's a heavy hindrance. It hurts you. God says you cannot run the race. You can't do what you're supposed to do if you don't lay it aside. Sin here literally means something that is an offense to your salvation. And that's going to hurt you. An offense to your salvation. Something you do that is going to make you miss the mark. That's what this kind of sin is. It's an offense and a hindrance to your very salvation. It's going to make you miss the mark because of your error. It's going to make you to not reach the prize and the goal. This kind of a sin is flat out life controlling in the way. And you let it happen. And furthermore, it's speaking about the saints who are compassed about with a fantastic, fabulously amazing cloud of witnesses. Now, isn't that something? We are torturing the cloud of witnesses by making them watch our dumb lives. What kind of deal is that? They went on to glory to see that show. What a drag. A heavy hindrance, a bending burden, an event, offense to your salvation. God says, lay that stuff down, man. There's a race that you're supposed to run. You're supposed to run it. With patience. It's been set before you. People keep talking about purpose. Who cares what your purpose is? Find out what God's purpose is. You have a race in front of you. You're tripping. You're falling. You're snotting all over yourself. Clean things up. Find out what you're supposed to do. One foot in front of the other wins the race. The heavy burden. The heavy load. The Bible's saying it has become a hindrance to you. Now that's enough of that. Lay it aside. And that sin that you do, that thing that you do, that thing that you keep doing, it's actually beginning to offend your very salvation. And pretty soon, you'll rise up and not know what it feels like anymore to be a child of God. But you'll know what to say, and half the time you'll know what to do. But the heavy weight, the hindrance will cause you to buckle it will cause you to bend, cause your face to hit the ground in a mess. You won't even recognize it's the sin, and it has easily beset me because I maintained my position under a burden that I didn't have a right to carry. When you maintain your right to sit under a burden that is not yours, you will commit this kind of offensive sin because you're no longer in your right mind. There was a man named James Garfield. And he was a lay preacher. He was the principal of his denominational college. Now, story has it that James Garfield was ambidextrous. He was a brilliant man besides that. He could simultaneously write Greek with one hand and Latin with the other. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was writing. He was a brilliant man. He devoted himself to this brilliance. And in 1880, he was elected president of the United States. And after six months in office, he was shot in the back. He never lost consciousness. They said he was tough that way. It's written down. They couldn't knock him out. He wouldn't go. Even at the hospital, they couldn't knock him out. They said he was an ox. He wouldn't go. He said, it's my pain. It's my call. And I'll be here to see it. Could not knock this man out. At the hospital, story has it that the doctor probed the wound with his little finger to seek out the bullet. He couldn't find it. So he tried a silver-tipped probe. Couldn't find it. So he took Garfield back to Washington, D.C. Despite the summer heat, they tried to keep him comfortable, but it was very hard to do. 
Still, James Garfield said, I will not be comforted in this my terror and this my trouble. I'll feel my pain and run the nation. And he did. However, he was growing weak. Teams of doctors tried endlessly to locate this bullet, probing and probing over and over. And the records and the documents go on and on of the people that came to probe into this hole to try to find the bullet. In desperation, they asked a man who had just invented a little device called the telephone. So they called Alexander Graham Bell over and they said, do you think you can have a little piece of equipment that might locate this bullet? We're having an awful hard time. So he said, well, I'll try. So he put some metal inside the president's body and fished around a bit. The man that invented the telephone was unsuccessful in finding the bullet, and we are not amazed at that. <laughs> he came, he sought, he failed. Other doctors, more yet still came. They came on boats, they came on buses. It came from all over the country to try to find a bullet in the president's body without killing him. The president hung on through July, through August. But in late September, President Garfield passed away. And they say he did not die from the wound. He died from the infection of all the probing and the poking is what killed him. So it is with people who leave error and sin and burden and unforgiveness in their life. And you pick at it and you pick at it and you pick at it and it'll kill you. It'll kill you. Sin will enslave you. Forgiveness will free you. When you don't forgive yourself, when you don't forgive God, and when you don't forgive others, you allow the devil to pick and poke, and pick and poke at your wound. And it's killing you. It's killing you slowly through July and through August. And it's awful hot. And then September comes. You could die. <laughs> Especially here during our September fast. Amen. Unforgiveness holds error. It holds an error to your life. So tonight I'm going to ask those of you who have unforgiveness to give it up. Just, just give it up. I'm done preaching. I don't know if I ever did preach. I just kind of hollered at you. But did you get it or should I go on? Unforgiveness will hold error to your life. It'll hold a hindrance to your life. It'll hold a burden to your life. It'll hold sin to your life, and you won't even know where it's coming from. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you've got a problem, it's because you haven't forgiven, and it's as clean and simple as that. So if you're having nightmares, you probably are unforgiving. How many is having nightmares? You're unforgiving. There you go. Something's in your life that is wrong. You're hooked on porn. You got bad thoughts in your mind. You're doing stuff you shouldn't do. You haven't forgiven. Maybe you're the product of a divorce and you don't even know you hate that person. But you do. It means you haven't forgiven. You can't carry a heavy load walking on a prairie, let alone climbing a hill. With unforgiveness, it's a heavy load. And what I know about unforgiveness is it's glue. It actually glues error to your life. So you can't escape from it. It slaps it down on you and heats it with fire. And all the trouble that you have, if you could just forgive, God would rush in and bless you more than you can bear. More than you can probably stand. Unforgiveness is the issue. 
And people say, well, I just wish I could quit this pornography. Pray against pornography. Why should I pray against pornography when you're hateful and you haven't forgiven? It's a dumb prayer. God says you have to forgive if you're going to hang around me. If you're going to climb that hill and carry that cross, you've got to forgive. The first thing Jesus did was forgave. And the last thing he did was forgave. So that's what we have to do all in between is forgive. Look for it. Oh, you sanctified. Look for it. Look for it tonight. And I'll just bet you that tomorrow things will be a lot better for you. Sometimes we don't know we have this unforgiveness issue. And we start acting out. We start behaving in a way. We don't even know what it is. We don't know why we're doing it. We're going crazy. We don't even know why. There's an unforgiveness there. I'll never forget my Uncle Jim, Dave's brother. I was working at the construction company and I was in charge of the money and I was in charge of making sure nobody went to jail and I was in charge of all that kind of thing and there was somebody in there who was making sure the money was gone and that everybody went to jail my arch enemy when I'm here to tell you I was right don't you think I was right sure I was right huh I was right <laughs> was it you <laughs> You know how you feel like you're right in a situation. I mean, I'm trying to keep everybody out of jail. I'm thinking I'm doing the right thing. I'm sure I'm going about it wrong, but I'm thinking I'm in some right. And this person comes in a meeting. And he starts saying how he organized all this stuff. And I'm looking at the contract as a corporate lawyer thinking, well, you know, there's at least five people going to go to jail over this. We're going to get eight lawsuits out of this. Why did you sign this contract? What have you done now? I was mad. I was fed up. And Uncle Jim, your brother, toward the end of his life, he would come out there and he would just kind of pray for everybody. And he was a very gentle man. And he would shuffle. He was shuffling back then. He would just shuffle. You know. And I'm fuming. And I am fuming. And this other person, oh, 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 and he takes off with the company check to go buy another car or lunch for strangers or something. You know, he's gone. And I'm fuming. And he walks by. He stops next to me. He goes, well, little sister. I said, what, Uncle Jim? And he goes, well, sounds to me like you have a root of bitterness. <laughs> and he kept going. I said, Uncle Jim, I chased him down. I said, now, Uncle Jim, now, you know this isn't right. You know how you do when you're wrong and you're trying to justify it. And I was chasing him down. Now, you know. And he looked at me and goes, well, all that's fine, but it doesn't change the fact you have a root of bitterness. <laughs> he was my uncle. I respected him. So I took my big old self down to the mat and darned if he wasn't right. Root of bitterness right there. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. I didn't go looking for it. I didn't plan for it. I didn't build it and raise it up as a child of mine. I didn't paint it and dress it up. It was given to me as a stinking lousy gift. And then I took care of it and babied it and loved on it because I was right. The Lord said, I don't care how right you are. You'll be wrong tomorrow. So it doesn't matter what they did to you. It matters what you do to them today. It matters how you behave under the wine press of God tonight. That's what matters. Nothing else. That's what matters. Where have I been while well, my world has been dying? Lord, teach me how to pray. None my 